we began a series in here. Does anyone remember what we were doing? It was Abraham, and I only got, I can't even, I was thinking I'd only done one lesson when the elders decided Beverly and I were going to do the marriage class. I may have done two lessons or something like that. Anyway, does anyone remember anything about those? Good. Okay. <laughs> because we're going to do a review, of, or not a review, but we're going to do those lessons again. And I'll tell you the truth, even as I'm looking over my notes and studying and everything, I don't remember doing it in here. So if I don't remember it, you probably don't either, okay? <laughs> Beverly remembers every word. Okay, how did I start? No, that's wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, we're going to be studying Abraham this quarter. Uh, I admire people who are authentic, people who are transparent. And the Bible is very unique in particularly re ancient religious literature in that it tells us about the people, the characters in the story, warts and all. The Bible is very transparent about people's lives. And it doesn't tell us fairy tales. It's a book about real life, real people who experience real, who have real experiences in a real world. And the reason is because we can learn about our real world and how to live in it by reading about the people who live their lives under God, okay? Uh, so this quarter, that's what we're going to do. We're going to follow the life of one of the greatest men in the Bible. Uh, I think you could make a good argument that next to Jesus, he's the most important person in the Bible. His story is told in Genesis chapters 12 to 25. <clears throat> and uh, I don't think what I just said is an exaggeration. I want you to consider these facts. Abraham is revered by the followers of the three major monotheistic religions in the world. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all trace their roots back to this one man, Abraham. He's the founder of the nation of Israel. His name is mentioned 308 times in the Old Testament and New Testament. He is the prototype of faith in the Bible. Nearly every time the basics of faith are talked about in the New Testament, who do the writers cite? They cite Abraham. He's a, he's a man whose life literally changed the course of history. He's the most important figure in the Old Testament with Jesus being the most important figure in the New Testament. But even with that, I want you to notice how the New Testament begins. Matthew 1 and verse 1 says, This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You see, when Matthew's wanting to impress his Jewish audience, which that's who Matthew wrote his gospel to, was the Jewish people, when he wrote this gospel to the Jewish people to impress his audience with who Jesus is, he didn't link him to Moses. He links him to the greatest king of Israel, and he, he links him to the founder of Israel himself. When the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 11, wants to explain what a life of faith looks like, he spends much more time talking about Abraham than he does anybody else in that chapter. I'm talking about by a long shot. Jesus spoke about Abraham's faith. The apostle Paul spoke about Abraham's faith. 
Over and over again, the New Testament, we have this repeated phrase, Abraham believed God, which really a better word there, in my opinion, is trusted God. Abraham trusted God. That's what faith is. Faith is trusting God and then acting upon that trust. And so a well-known pastor from years ago, a man by the name of Ray Steadman, said this. If you ever carved the Mount Rushmore of faith, you would have to start with Abraham. Can you imagine having a Mount Rushmore of faith and not having Abraham on it? <laughs> so, in order to understand Abraham's life, we've got to go way back. We've got to go back 40 centuries to the end of the Bronze Age, 2000 B.C. The place was called Ur of the Chaldeans. It's on the banks of the Euphrates River. This is some of the ruins of the ancient city of Ur. In the back there, you see a ziggurat. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. And that's been restored to some extent. But these are the ancient walls of the city of Ur. What, 4,000 years old or more. Uh, here's where it is. And maybe this will help give you a picture of, of a lot of things that develop in the Bible. But you see Ur is on the eastern side of this map. And it's right there on the Euphrates River. Uh, you have the Tigris River and the Euphrates River that run pretty much parallel down to the Persian Gulf. Uh, the Euphrates River runs through what today would be Iraq. In fact, you remember when Saddam Hussein was captured a few years ago? Where was he? He was right on the banks of the Euphrates River. No, I'm sorry, I've got that. It was the Tigris River, wasn't it? One of those rivers was where they found him in that hole in the ground. So it runs through Iraq. And then it comes out right there in the Persian Gulf in what today is Kuwait. And you see the vast expanse between Ur and Jerusalem if you just went east, if you just went west from Ur. But people didn't travel that way. You know why? Desert. It's desert. In fact, this is part of the desert where Moses and the Israelites roamed around for 40 years. You see. Uh, you see on the left-hand side, lower side, that's Egypt. And then if you come straight east from there, all of that area is desert. And so Abraham starts in Ur. Uh, historians tell us that during the, during the time that Abraham would have been alive, Ur would have had about 250,000 people. That's, that is a huge city for 2000 B.C. It was a thriving city. It had an ancient university there. It had a large library. It was a center of pagan worship, and that's what this ziggurat would, would have been for. Uh, the people worshipped a pantheon of mythical gods, with their head god being named Sin. Now, don't make any connection with when we sin, other than if you worship a pagan god, it's a sin. But that name didn't have the same meaning, okay? Uh, they regarded sin to be the Lord of heaven. They regarded sin to be the creator, the divine creator. And like his neighbors and his relatives, Abraham worshipped idols. Abraham accepted this mythology. I should be saying Abram at this point, okay? I'm going to do that a lot, so just hang with me on that. Uh, but we learn that from Joshua chapter 40, 24 and verse 2. <clears throat> so he lived the first 99 years of his 175 years as Abram. And we'll talk more about that later on, the change of the name. But when we first meet him here in Genesis chapter 12, he's 75 years old which I'm guessing at that time would have been 
somewhere past middle age, but really still kind of middle age. So far as we know, he was not looking for God at all. Rather, God approached him. It is a pure act of grace that Abraham becomes the man that he is. So here's what it says, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. I want you to notice this wording, and I'll say more about it in just a moment. The Lord had said to Abram. Isn't that interesting? When we first meet him, it speaks in past tense about him. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Some have called this the single most important verse in the Bible. Would you have picked it? Here's why they say that. Everything that follows this verse flows out of this verse. Everything in the Bible flows out of this verse. Through the Old Testament, to the coming of Jesus as Messiah, to the church, to the promise of Jesus' return, it all comes out of this promise. So let's go back and let's see what God asked Abraham to do in chapter 12 and verse 1. Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. God says to him, leave your country, leave your people, leave your father's household, and go to a land I'll show you. I want you to think about this for a moment. You're past middle age. Most of us are going to have to look in the rearview mirror to make any... uh, make any sense out of this, but you're past middle age, your spouse is in her mid-60s, you've lived in the same place for your whole life, you have a family, you have a city you're familiar with, you, you have a community, and suddenly this God that you didn't even know exists uh, appears to you and calls you to leave all of that. Wouldn't you love to be able to listen in on what that conversation must have been like? Because you do realize in Scripture, we don't necessarily have everything quoted. Our Bibles would be this thick if we had the whole conversation. I kind of picture it going like this. God says, Abraham, this is God speaking. I want you to leave everything and go to a land that I'll show you. And Maybe Abram said, well, where is it? God says, well, if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. Abraham says, try me. God says, well, it's about 1,500 miles from here. Now, can you imagine back in those days how far that would have been? About 1,500 miles. It's in a place called Canaan. Abram says, well, I've never heard of Canaan. God says, I know, and guess what else? I'm going to make you the father of a nation. Abram says, me? I don't even have any kids, and it's not because we haven't been trying. And God says, don't worry, just trust me. Abram says, let me see if I got this straight. You want me to leave everything I've ever known, travel 1,500 miles to some place I've never heard of, and I'm going to become the father of a nation. God says, that's right. Abram says, is this this some kind of joke? What am I supposed to tell my wife? God says, that's your problem. Everything in us recoils to something like that, doesn't it? We don't really want to take a leap until we know what we're leaping into. 
Here's what the writer of Hebrews tells us. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. And that's how it is when we live by faith. Believing God, stepping out, trusting, stepping out into what we believe, not knowing what the future holds, but trusting the one who holds the future, right? He obeyed and went, it says. He may have doubted. He may have wondered. But he went. And so it's at this point that God makes this covenant with him. You know, over the past few years, I've had a number of people who want to talk about what they understand covenant to be. And i got to tell you, sometimes people think they know what covenant is, and they really don't. And they make some theological assumptions on those things that they really don't know what they're talking about. They talk as if all covenants were the same. But we need to understand, even in the Bible, there are unconditional covenants and there are conditional covenants. They're not all the same. A conditional covenant would basically say, you keep your part of the bargain and I'll keep my part of the bargain. But an unconditional covenant says, I'm going to keep my part of the bargain no matter what you do. The covenant we're getting ready to read is an unconditional covenant. The covenant God's going to make with Israel is a conditional covenant. You keep my ways, you obey my commands, I will be your God. Okay, that's conditional. This one's not. And that's part of the reason, perhaps, why this is one of the most important verses in the Bible. So here's what it says. <clears throat> I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Unconditional covenant. He never says anything about what Abraham has to do in order for this to be true, does he? So this covenant includes three major areas of blessing. There's a national blessing, there's a personal blessing, and thank God there's a universal blessing that applies to you and me. The national blessing is that Abraham's descendants are going to become a nation. This barren couple who are already at this point, and this is 25 years before they're going to have a child, but they're already past their child-rearing years, child-bearing years, They've given up hope of ever having a child, much less have a nation. And for this blessing even, they're going to have to wait, aren't they? Man, I don't like having to wait for the outcome of something that I'm wanting for a week. They wait 25 years. And when Abraham's confidence wavers through that period of time, God returns to him. And we have at least two examples during that 25 years of God returning to him and God repeating his unconditional covenant. His covenant's also personal. God promised to make Abraham's name great and to bless him. In chapter 13, verse 2, it says, Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. In chapter 23 and verse 6, the Hittites are going to refer to Abraham as a mighty prince among us. So God makes his name great. But God also gives him a universal promise. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The land in which God's sending Abraham is a little land bridge. Let me see if I can get to a map there. 
You see where that line comes down from Haran down to the south? Everything west of that line is pretty much what we would know as Palestine today. And it's like a land bridge between the Mediterranean Sea and the desert. You cross the Jordan River and you're in the desert. And so the only way people could travel back then would be to follow this route that looks like you're going way out of your way, but that was the way to travel if you were wanting to go to Egypt, for instance. It was called the King's Highway. You have the major... Uh, can't even think of the term I'm looking for. Uh, major superpower, we'll say, in the Chaldeans. Well, their way over by the Persian Gulf, you have the major superpower of Egypt that's on the left side of the map. Up north, you have... Uh, the Babylonians, and you've got the Assyrians, and all of them would use this trade route in order to get from one place to the other. Uh, so the land that God's wanting to give Abraham is a land that's going to have opportunity to reach people of all different backgrounds and nationalities. Now, at this point, we need to back up a little bit, <clears throat> and literally, I'm doing that with this slide, and we need to read what happens at the end of chapter 11. It says, this is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Ishka. Now, Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. And when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. According to Stephen, as he's making his defense before the Jewish officials in Acts chapter 7, according to Stephen, Abraham actually received this call prior to this. That's why it was important when I read verse 1 a while ago that it says, God had said to Abraham. He made his call prior to this. And so Terah has now moved his family about 800 miles from Ur to Haran. You see Haran up at the very top of the map. So he's made that much of the journey already, and this is where they stop. According to ancient inscription. The main trade routes from Damascus, which would be a little bit southwest of where Haran is there on the map, right on the seacoast. So the major trade routes from Damascus, which some believe is the oldest city in the world, by the way, to Nineveh, which would be north of there, and Carchemish, all of them converged in Haran. The god of sin had two principal seats of worship. One of them was in Ur of the Chaldeans. Guess where the other one was? In Haran. And so they settle in Haran for a while, which suggests that Abraham didn't completely obey God, right? He stopped at this place and settled. But after Terah died, we pick up the story again. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh in Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel 
on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. So at this point, Abram and Sarai have passed through Tel Dan, which if you're following that route that I showed you a while ago, the way to enter into Israel from the north would have been through the ancient city of Tel Dan, which today is on the northern end of Israel. In fact, right across the fence is Syria. This gate that I'm showing you a picture of here is called Abraham's Gate. This gate dates to 4,000 B.C. So it was 2,000 years old when Abram went through it. It's just recently been discovered, really. Uh, but there's no doubt Abram and Sarai went through that gate as they're coming from the northeast, coming into the promised land. Tell Dan. Then they would have been entering into the heart of the promised land, making their way to Shechem, which is today in the West Bank of Israel, a place that it's not easy to visit anymore. But they went to the tree or the oak of Moreh. Uh, the historical records indicate that the Canaanites had shrines that they built in groves of trees, large trees, particularly oak trees, because they believed that large trees were evidence of uh, reproductive power. And so if you worship there, then you would have a better chance of being fertile. So at Shechem, Abram uh, built an altar, a monument to one man's obedience the one true God. What this monument really announced is the God of Abraham is now in Canaan. And then moving further south, going up in elevation as he went, Abram comes to Bethel. You see Bethel there just right under Shechem. Uh, Bethel is also in the West Bank today. But they come to Bethel, which was an important city until David takes Jerusalem later on. Bethel is where the priests were. This is where worship was until Jerusalem becomes the holy city. Now from there, he continues on to the Negev. Negev is really just a word for desert. It means dry and parched. So the Negev is all that desert region that you see from where it says Jerusalem over to Ur of the Chaldeans and then off the map to the south. This is all desert. And they come to Beersheba. We've all heard of Beersheba, right? Why did anyone live in Beersheba? It's right in the middle of the desert. Nothing there. It was the same then. But Beersheba was a major city in this area. Uh, so he's in far southern Israel, the Negev. It would be like if you drew a line from Jerusalem, kind of south, uh, southeast, it would be out there just in the middle of nowhere. This is Beersheba. Uh, verse 10 says, Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. Okay, as a newcomer to the promised land, to Israel, Abram was probably not accustomed with famine. Where was he from? The Fertile Crescent, okay? Remember that map, the Tigris-Euphrates River? In between there was the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia. Uh, they didn't know drought, famine. I mean, that was a very fertile area of the world. So this season of famine presents a major test for Abraham. And God, whether he caused the famine or not, I don't know, but God is going to use that famine to develop Abraham's faith. Uh, God often does that with us. He uses difficult circumstances to grow us. You know that, don't you? 
That's usually the way growth comes, is through difficult circumstances. And those tests expose what might be our default response to crisis. Every one of us has a default response to crisis, right? Do you know what yours is? For some people, it might be to flee. For some people, it might be to isolate themselves. For someone else, it might be anger. Uh, we all have a default setting for Christ. It appears that Abram's default setting was deception, lying. He lies to save his own skin. So I want you to notice that we're told that Abram went to Egypt, but nowhere are we told that God told him to go there. All right? Rather than seek God's instruction, he makes a beeline to where no doubt caravan merchants have told him there's plenty of food down in Egypt. They're not experiencing a famine. So he takes his family there. Verse 11 says, as he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. By the way, that's a good thing for you guys to say to your wives, okay? When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you're my sister, so that I'll be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. Now, in case you're tempted to point fingers at Abram and talk about what a terrible thing that he's done is here, Paul, as he uses the Old Testament, uses it to remind us of things like this. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation is overtaken you except what is common to mankind. In other words, use these stories to encourage you in your own faith because you're not above doing the same kinds of things. No one wakes up in the morning and says, I think that today I'm going to have a spectacular moral failure. I mean, none of us do that. Our days usually begin with the best of intentions. Then some crisis comes along, and we tend to default to our crisis management position. The brain in crisis tends to think on a horizontal plane rather than on this vertical plane with God. Now, technically, technically Abraham's just telling a half lie here. Because we learn in Genesis 20 and verse 12 that Sarai was his half-sister. He might be killed when they get to Egypt if they find out he's her husband. But if he is her guardian, which as her brother, that's what he would be, then anyone who wants to woo Sarai has to go through the guardian in order to do that, which would give Abram then time for self-preservation self action. So not long after arriving in Egypt, his lie is put to the test. It says, when Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman, and when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. <clears throat> so rather than giving him the wiggle room that he was hoping he would find, now he's trapped. Because Sarai is beautiful, Pharaoh decides to make her a part of the royal harem. Now, fortunately, in those days, before you would officially become a part of the harem, you would be set aside for a while so that they could make sure you weren't already pregnant. And we're going to assume that's what happened here. We're going to assume there's been no sexual contact. But meanwhile, Pharaoh sending Abram numerous wedding gifts in anticipation of the great day. And when you're the recipient of all of this stuff, who's going to sit around nitpicking morality? 
<laughs> Surely all of this prosperity proves that Abraham was right to lie about his wife, right? Wrong. And imagine how she felt. His cowardice has placed her in danger while he's living the high life. While she's living with this uncertain future, he's hobnobbing with the Egyptian elite. So while he failed to protect his wife, God acted on his behalf. And it says, but the Lord afflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. Maybe they figured it out when all of them got sick, but Sarai didn't. And what follows is one of the most humiliating episodes in Abram's life. Because God is going to use a pagan to chastise his chosen one. Pharaoh shows more character than Abram does at this point. Because it says, so Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men. And they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. So Abram leaves Egypt, tail tucked, shoulders slumped, back to the land that he never should have left to begin with. Now what do you think that conversation between Abram and Sarah was like as they make their way back to the promised land? I doubt he got any sympathy from her. My guess is there may not have even been words exchanged for several days, which would have spoken even louder than if she had said something. And you guys all know what I'm talking about, don't you? And I wonder, what kind of impression did Pharaoh now have of Abram's God? but I want you to notice that God doesn't punish Abram for what happened here. In fact, he blesses him. God uses this horrible incident to make Abram richer. He now has male and female servants that he didn't have before, as we read in chapter 12 and verse 16. But listen here. One of those servants, A woman by the name of Hagar is going to end up being a real trouble spot for Abram. And it's not really all her, it's not her fault, but it's all a result, result of the choices that Abram makes along the way. It's going to bring a lot of pain into his life. That's where we're going to leave the story for this week. Uh, it's time for us to close. So I'm going to ask you if you would to pray with me. <clears throat> Father, we are so encouraged that uh, as we read Scripture, uh, we don't read where you've polished up and made, uh, made up, uh, covered over mistakes of people, but that we see total transparency. And uh, so I'm grateful for this story of the life of Abram, Abraham. And may we learn from it, may we learn what, uh, from this man who had many flaws, and yet a man that you consider to be a prototype of faith, let us learn some good lessons from that, Father. And we are so privileged today to be able to gather here, to worship you, to honor you, and Lord, uh, we, we don't want to fail in so please receive our worship today. In Jesus' name.